I'm Phil Liggett and this is The Wheelhouse. Thank you very much, Phil Liggett. This is indeed The Wheelhouse podcast. My name's Joel Spreadborough, joined as always by the luminous, effervescent Catherine Bates. Hello, Kate. Luminous, effervescent. I'll take that. It's good to be back. (laughs) I'm glad I got those two in before completely stuffing up your name, which I've known for many years now. But anyway, we'll get over that. Plenty plenty to come on the Wheelhouse podcast, Back in the Bunker, yet again. uh, A duel for the ages, massive wheelies, uh, Cavs' first outing and a budding bromance that I think might go sour. Esteban Chavez, the toast of Colombia. And will Podgers' early season decisions give a chance for Vine to shine all that and much much more coming up on the wheelhouse podcast first let's talk cyclocross because (laughs) that was pretty special now let's start with our our duel um i'm gonna bring up tipping okay because i said gee kate strange for you to go against your guy wout and you're like no no i'm gonna stick with i'm gonna stick with van der poel and i was like whatever i went with wout i Mm. was wrong I'm, I'm How are you happy feeling about that now? Yeah. <laughs> I feel that soon I'm going to feel vindicated, but for now I feel rather sheepish. Yes. Well, you know, to be honest, I think it was one of the most amazing jewels that we have ever seen. And uh, I would have felt a little bit guilty if we had have actually won and I'd bet against him. Uh, it may be the only time this season I do bet against him, to be honest. So I'm kind of glad that uh, Vanderpool pulled it off for me. Uh, but look, I, I just don't, think in the history of the sport and many sports you have the same kind of rivalries that we've seen between Vanderpool and uh and Van Art and, and they've got photos of them from their first junior world championships together when they were one and two uh up until now and um they've both grown up a considerable amount but actually Vanderpool doesn't look too much different but uh Wout looks like uh he certainly was a bit of an ugly duckling um as a as a junior, and he's he's grown into himself, so oh, to speak. A bit of an ugly duckling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, three minutes in, shots fired. I love it. But uh, the 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 event itself, we'll get to the duel soon. I want to talk about the event because massive crowds, TV coverage was electric. That duel was its was its own. Of course, the women as well. We spoke about Fem Van Ampel and and the beautifully named Puck Peters coming in for that rivalry. I just want to quickly talk about the cyclocross event because it's it's obviously got some massive traction and uh thomas van der spiegel has has come out he's he's the guy behind the world cup and he's like here's what works what doesn't and there's some very obvious things that work it's obviously the the short duration the fact that there's high visibility it's great for sponsors they're doing laps great for crowds they're seeing so many of them the evenness of the men's and women's but he's come out and said we have to make a plan that gives cyclocross a future without matthew and wow, mm. I find that really intriguing because it's like, yeah, yeah, these guys are great and they're massive box office, but they're not going to be here forever. We want this sport to grow. He suggested mixing the calendar up a bit, um, to- tossing out the Christmas races in Belgium, subbing something out. I love, I love hearing that from him because like, even Belgium wants a break at Christmas and also mm. combining cyclocross with gravel a little bit more to give it year round appeal. Now you're you're screwing your face up. What's that? Does that? Is that an early hint that you're not on board with his comments? I am. Uh, I'm not on board with the Christmas calendar kind of stuff because, like, Jingle Cross and, you know, Christmas Cross in Belgium is is a huge thing and it isn't even about UCI rankings or anything like that. It's just a really cool tradition. The fans love it. The athletes love it. And I think this is a really common mistake that our sport makes in every discipline from um, road to track to cyclocross is they find something that they think works and they want to rejig and take out some of the tradition. I'm not on board with that. I mean, it's here and it's so popular because of that tradition um, you know, I think so. They, look, they can evolve definitely, and and keep building the momentum. And fair comment that Vanderpool and Van Art won't be here forever. Uh, but I don't reckon you mess with the calendar. And as for introducing gravel and all no. that jazz, cyclocross is not broken. Cyclocross is such a cool discipline on its own, and gravel okay. is an emerging discipline as well. I think. I just don't know why you'd want to. It's going so well. Why are we messing with it and smooshing them together? Don't if it ain't broke, says Kate Bates. Yes, I'm not on board with it. Can I ask you a question? So coming out of a very successful summer of cycling here in Australia, this this product to me has 
so much appeal. Why isn't it bigger domestically? Why isn't it bigger here? We've got some great riders. The package yeah. that they present. Why is it not? Why? What's happening? <laughs> Help me. Help me understand. Why is it not? Uh, yeah, good question. I mean, I, I think first and foremost, we see cyclocross as a European sport. But if we're honest, it's actually kind of a Belgian and Dutch sport and yep. it's just on the edge of Europe so everybody can get there and it's easy and it turns kind of into a European sport. The Americans have gotten on board a little bit, uh, but the biggest thing they have in common that we do not, Joel, is the the timing of their winter around Christmas. Uh, if we were to do it in Australia... Uh, firstly, we don't even have all the snow and the sleet in many places like they do. But even putting that aside for a second, it, our winter it would fall in the middle of the road domestic road season, which would just clash. And, you know, I don't even think our road season is at a point yet where it can afford to um, dilute the athletes by doing that. Um, but I think on top of that, any of our athletes that are um, travelling overseas, that rules them out. If you look at the other part of the season so that it would run parallel to the European season, I mean, firstly, it's summer, um, certainly not going to work nearly as well or give our athletes nearly the kind of skills or be as enjoyable or have that same mud and snow and mess element yeah. um, that they have in Europe. So, you know, I think realistically we need to get more athletes into it and we have got a domestic racing season now, but I'm not sure we can ever expect it to be quite uh, like it is in Belgium. But we did have two athletes who rode the World Championships in Hygge Hyde. Um, so Tristan Ward and Sam Northey, they both competed in under-23 men and under-19 men respectively. And so, you know, bit by bit we're seeing Aussie faces in there and, you know, matter of time. I mean, they've been doing it in okay. Belgium for, you know, 100-plus years. So we're yeah. on the back foot, but uh, we can get there bit by bit. I think it's a product that would electrify audiences if it did. It get is that cool. Sort of, yeah, it that is grandstand cool. billing over here. Anyway, we'll see. I hate to bring up tipping, but I want to talk about the women's race. Uh, we'll we'll get onto the other duel. I just want to talk quickly about the showdown between Dutch superstar Fem Van Empel and again the best name in cycling, Park Peters. Now, last week it was like, who who are we going to tip? Who are we going to tip? I'm not rubbing it in, but you tipped um, Park. Just just a gentle reminder. <laughs> Um, but you, that's okay. You're telling furfies today, Joel. You started by saying I hate to bring up tipping. You brought it up because you one up to me on that occasion. I'd say we're one each. PS. One a piece. That's okay. Uh, one, one a piece. A piece. In wheelhouse tipping. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, well, look, I, I was a bit bummed for Puck actually. She didn't have the best day out, um, but. You know, she still walks away with a silver medal at the World Championships and she did come over the line um, feeling quite joyous um, with her silver yeah. medal. Can't, you know, you, you can't uh, criticise her for that. Well, you can, but who would we be to criticise her for that? So I'll well, let you, you yeah. have the win with Fem Van Empel. Um She did have 20 wins this season, so probably on paper it would have been um, but, yeah, Puck Peters and her wheelie over the line. Surely that's got to get me bonus points in the tipping yeah, no, competition, I, right? No bonus style points. Stakes. But I, I love how you said she walked over the line. She didn't walk over the line. She wheelied over the oh, line for a second. Yes. So the silver women's wheelie forevermore is is is, is in folklore. How good. I, I, I think, like, good on her. The skills display is awesome. But I want to ask, she, she dropped a pedal off the start. She was a bit sluggish. Fem sort of found her way up to the front quite quickly. How costly was that for Puck? And to still finish in second after a bit of a, a sluggish start. Yeah, look, it, it's, cyclocross is, like, pretty explosive. You know, it's less than an hour. What happens off the start line means a lot. Uh, she had a bit of a rusty start missing her pedal. Um, anybody who's tried clipless pedals for the first time has probably missed their pedal 150 times before they got it right. Uh, no surprise, the pros get caught on that too uh, but it was actually with three laps to go she she just had a bit of a moment and had a, a little stack like it was a bit inconsequential probably didn't need to happen but lost her concentration and at that moment Fan Van Empel she really turned on the afterburners and I think it was that moment um, that cost it for her so I don't know from start to almost finish she was just that little bit off the, the wheelies okay over the line is probably the best bit of the whole race for her. <laughs> so but um, she's so, young. They're both so young. So we'll yeah. see a lot of them in the future. 
a duel to continue for years and years. And and you think like drop pedals happen, but you're saying it didn't entirely puck up her chances as far as you're concerned. <laughs> I don't think that pucked it up for her, no. No, okay. <laughs> a pucking good day out for both of them. And the Silver Women's Willie, as I say, will live on in folklore. The men, let's let's quickly what what about what a wout bout that was. And I love that because he came out on Twitter and he basically said I love it, but gee, I hate it. Like I love the the connection these athletes have, even though they're besties. It's like they, they don't want to lose to one another. And Wout made that really clear in the aftermath. Where he's like, "This sport, oh, I love it. Give it a cuddle, but also go away." Uh, what do you think mm. of the showdown? I think it was everything we hoped it would be. Absolutely everything we hoped it would be. The crowd was epic. Like. I haven't seen that kind of a crowd at any cycling event um, before. The only one that has maybe come close is the mountain biking in Les Getz last year uh, with the downhill. But it was the sprint that was just blew me away. The acceleration from Vanderpool. Um, and if you're watching, you can see the acceleration that we're talking about. Mm. But, he, Joel, it's just literally like he goes into another gear, steps it up and accelerates away. It's rare to see that happened to Van Aert, uh, where yeah. another rider is able to get that kind of distance in a sprint. But Vanderpool, he was just all on that day, absolutely all on. Everything went perfectly for him. Uh, and it means finish. a lot to him. Yeah, it really was an incredible finish. And it was no surprise, I think, to anybody that it was just the two of them at the finish together. Uh, but there, I don't know. What I took from it was there was just – an emotional part for Vanderpool that there wasn't for Van Aert. You know, it, it was a home world for him. Um, I mean, Hugo Hyde is essentially in Belgium, if you look at a map, but not quite. Uh, uh -huh. And his dad had to do with the course design. Yes, and, we sp I want to ask you about that. We yeah. spoke about course design uh, on the last episode of this podcast. What, where, how, did it play a role? Remember, we, we, we spoke about this. It's like, uh, don't worry, son, I've, I've got you. It's all good. Uh, you'll be right. <laughs> Just I like love you your accent, Joel. Boy. Yeah, I don't. Okay, like, yeah, bring know, on 2023 and Joel's accents and impersonations. Oh, I reckon I probably did. I mean, even just from a confidence point of view, yeah. Um, he rode with more confidence than we've seen in a little while, actually. And Van Art's career progression has been, you know, almost quite linear, which is unusual. But um, between um, his cross and his road over the last couple of years, Vanderpool, yeah, he's been, you know less linear. I mean, if we remember yeah. the disaster at the Olympic Games with the mountain biking, um, epic stack. I mean, that was spectacular, but didn't serve him well. And last season, it just wasn't all coming together for him in the way that it was for Van Aert. So I think for him, this was a big time to announce that he's back. He's um, back. Yeah. Well, I mean, I reckon there's been a lot of conversation in the last 12 months about is this the moment where Van Aert has accelerated off to greatness and Vanderpool's yeah. been left behind a little bit and, you know, maybe he belongs more on cyclocross than he does on the road. And yeah. I reckon this might have been a little moment for him to say, um, yeah. stick that in your coat pocket. Shove it. I'm back. Yeah. And his dad saying, look, Matthew, I look after you. This is like, just like when you were a little boy. <laughs> uh, no, I'm yes. sorry. I'm going to stop. I Look, <laughs> it, it, it's not the rivalry continues. They're going to meet again. Uh, several times. Uh, th th this will be headline acts. Uh, Strad Bianchi, uh, Milan San Remo, Tour of Flanders, Paris Roubaix. Huge for the sport, but I do go back to the Van den Spiegel's thoughts that uh, they're not going to be there forever, so you still have to mm. make uh, make a sport appealing without them. And there will be days where Daddy doesn't design the course as well, so <laughs> you, you need to do it no. on your own merits. It's, I, look, shots fired. Let's move on on the Wheelhouse podcast from two massive names to and arguably, well, uh, definitely a, an even more massive name. Uh, Tade Pogaccia, the Podge, has 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 tweaked his early season strategy somewhat, and he's not going to go to UAE. He's not going to tour UAE and defend his title there. Um, he wants to de debut in Spain instead, blah, blah, blah. Good for him. He can do whatever he wants. What I'm getting at is, <laughs> is this a chance for Jay Vine to step up really early for UAE? Yeah, blah, 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 Pog, whatever. You do, uh, do what you want, yeah. Yeah. It, I reckon it's interesting, actually. There's a couple of elements to it. It's To go to Andalusia in Spain rather than the UAE tour. Like the UAE tour for Team UAE is like a mini tour de France. It's so very, very important to them. They wouldn't be 
moving him off it for no reason. I've got a theory. You know, I love my conspiracy theories. Are you ready for this one? I, I can't wait. Okay. All right. I reckon that Podge and his bout of gastroenteritis, which he has so wonderfully let us know that he's got bad guts. I always have a bit of a giggle when they're so transparent with what um, their health issues are. But, you know, hopefully he's feeling a little bit better. I reckon his form isn't as good as Jay Vine's. And I reckon because it's such an important race, they want a better chance of winning and they've shifted oh. shifted the teams. How do you like this that for a theory? from Kate Bates. I'm going to ring the I bell, mean, I the could, conspiratorial I, bell. I could be wrong. I sometimes am, Joel, but sometimes I'm right. I'm often right. And <laughs> there's my theory. Mostly factual. <laughs> uh, look, uh, it's got some merit. It, it, a bit crook, crook in the guts, as he's very v- vividly outlined for us all. Thanks for that. Mm. That's massive. That's huge. And what a great investment of faith, but also Jay's confidence. Mm. We've seen he's a confident guy. Sure, guys. Mm. Hold my beer kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Well, I have heard some rumours, uh, Joel, that the pressure inside that team this year is quite high. They are not interested in seconds and thirds. They are yep. all about the win. And uh, they've got a lot of riders who they've put um, quite an investment in, not just financially, but even in terms of their preparation and, um, you know, building a team around them. I think they're... They're pushing them pretty hard to get some big results. And, you know, a, a rider like Pog, you can't make the whole team about him. Absolutely not. And if UAE Tour is such an important race for them, then they need to put a team on the line that can realistically go for that victory. It's still yeah. really early season for Pog. You know, he hasn't been racing yet. So it, it wouldn't be unusual and it also wouldn't be, it's not like that's my theory, but it it's not like a dirty theory or something. Nobody should be offended if that's the case. Um, yeah. But it does really play into the hands um, yeah. of definitely of Jay Vine. Um, and we also have to remember that they have a women's team now as well. And so they have of a course. women's tour uh, starting this weekend as well. So that'll be huge. And a lot of the um, local riders, there's a couple of females who are headquartered out of Dubai who are getting to race at home for the first time that are really excited about having pro cycling uh, in their country, being able to role model to the um, young girls in particular. So I think it's a really cool thing that the women are there now as well because historically we used to have a a tour of Qatar as well with the men, but the the women weren't invited to any of the other races. So it's good to see that happening. Important and essential and very sensical progress there so that's that's really good to hear um i'm interested there's a bit of gravel in pog's immediate future as well um i I think the first event he's going to there's going to be some gravel parts as well so he's he's mixed it up yeah and he's known to have really good skills so you know i think he needs to start with something that makes him comfortable and andalusia i just love saying that andalusia it sounds like uh, it sounds nice. It sounds very Antonio Banderas kind of. Ah, uh, very good. <laughs> uh, I think that it'll be a really good race for him. It's a little lower tier in terms of pressure and visibility for that team, so I think it it'll suit them to get going um, for that. But yeah, I, I mean everything UAE. I think we just got to start talking about Jay Vine more. Well, yeah, we do need a vine jar, we mentioned recently as well. And and we do, we'll do reiterate that when criticism is due, it will be duly offered as well. It's not just a gush fest. I'm just interested in opportunities and strategies at this time of year. And I just think, wow, obviously a big event for them. And here you go. Here's a headline opportunity for you. Anyway, on the Wheelhouse podcast, I'd love to read a quote to you, Kate Bates. So wearing the national colours for a year is something I will never forget. Now, imagine that said through a, a, a veil of thick, thick emotion and tears, because that's exactly what happened uh, when Esteban Chavez won his first Colombian road race title, coming after a tough few years. Wow, the scenes here. This guy, the, as far as what it means to an athlete, <laughs> it, there's no rawer display of this. It, it, it is incredible pictures, and if you jump onto our social media you can have a look at him standing on the podium and absolutely bawling his eyes out. And speaking about what it means to Colombians, I've got one more quote here. I'm sorry to, to bury you in quotes, but I think it's worth <laughs> it. 
People take the bus for 10 hours, 100% just to see us. So this is special. Competing for the jersey is a dream for everyone growing up. Dreaming of wearing the Colombian jersey during the tour or during the Giro. The, the whole season with the Colombian jersey. That is it. I'm the man. I'm the boss. It's like, look at me. I am from Colombia. That is what he said after claiming the jersey. Where do you even begin to unpack what this means to this rider? I'm the man. I'm the boss. So many tears um, Full from fried Chavez. Tears. Yeah. Just so emotional uh, on the podium. I mean, incidentally, Danny Martinez was second. Quintana was third in his uh, mm. black and white neutral colours. He also shed some tears. I think it's a massive – his quotes at first when you were reading that first one out, I was like, was that my quote after I won nationals? Um, <laughs> it's kind of – there were some tears as well. I, I think it's a really common sentiment when you not only win the race but you realise that you get to wear then – uh, your country's stripes for the entire year. That's the special part of it uh, yep. is that when you go to Europe, you then carry uh, that with you. He's writing for EF um, Education. It is just huge. For Colombians, it is incredible. Uh, these guys play such an important role culturally, um, inspirationally. They're athletes. You know, in Colombia, they really, really hold them up kind of as demigods and um Chavez, well, let's be honest, he's had a really crap decade. Uh, mm. In 2013, he had a massive accident that nearly cost him his racing career. And he's come back in fits and bursts, but he's continued to have uh, some massive setbacks. And for him to just keep plugging on and then to take this victory, it's massive. It's his first one-day victory since 2016. So, you know, that's a little bit of a drought. And uh, yeah. I think the emotion flowing, it just said it all. It's pretty cool. But what I'm really hoping, uh, Joel, so the Colombian jersey, when it goes to a professional team, and it's the same for Australia, it's the base colour is white and then you have the three stripes of their flag across it. And yep. in Australia we have the green and gold. Uh, <laughs> the jersey is dictated by the National Federation, so you can't get creative with it. It just is what it is. But I'm really hoping that uh, EF Education First choose not to pair it with white nicks because um, I'm not a fan of the whole white kit. Oh, okay. that might be an unpopular view, uh, but or maybe it comes from um, a little bit of scarred memory on my own front, Joel, because I spent okay. a season in white nicks and was constantly apologising, um, especially in the rain, to the other riders saying, I'm really sorry I'm in white nicks in the rain. Uh, but I think that they can do a really classy job with his kit and make him look fantastic, um, just hopefully not white nicks. Okay, sure. So mm -hmm. zero chance of winning you over to test cricket by the sound of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what is all the white about? I mean, come on now. Oh, Kate, how dare you? It's a tradition <laughs> history of the orthodox <laughs> nature of this sport. Anyway, I, I love that that special stuff. We speak a lot about what happens between the ears and having that jersey on and that thought of people driving 10 hours and idolising these riders. Putting a few tough years behind him in 23, this is a great way to start it. I wonder how much extra special stuff, and I don't mean that in a dodgy way but like, from within oh, i wonder Joel. how much that's i'm sorry you know what i mean special <laughs> stuff special mana there you go how much mana do. is he going to get out of this uh, a lot a lot racing in that jersey it's the same as racing in a world champions jersey you just kind of it's, it's validation every time you get dressed yeah, uh racing or training is. and that's kind of cool massive massive moment full frame tears from chavez well done to him um well done to Nairo as well, by the way. Shutting out the noise to, to finish strongly there as well because he's had a, a topsy-turvy couple of months as well. Someone Indeed. else who's had a very topsy-turvy couple of months and is a friend of the wheelhouse, even though he doesn't know it, is, of course, the Manx missile himself, uh, Mark Cavendish. Now, I want to talk about this because he's debuting on uh, Circle This One in Your Diary. The 11th of February will be his first outing for Astana, of course, at the Tour of Oman. Now, he's come out and said bring it basically which is great we're used to that he says there's less pressure there's less expectation at Astana I'm not expected to jump through hoops yet I remain dead keen on the tour for obvious reasons there's a certain record uh that he's he's pursuing there but he's brought up uh Alexander Vinkorov Vinokorov the uh the manager of Astana and said basically bro like bro 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 this guy's awesome doesn't make me you know run around jumping in circles. He's no Patrick Lefebvre, put it that way. 
love him to bits. I'm, I'm, I love comments like this before a pedal has been struck, to be honest. I wonder how that relationship goes when times are tense and Cav's getting a bit frayed and flustered and that kind of thing. Secondly, talks about pressure and expectation. There's no pressure. There's no expectation. I think he's putting the pressure and expectation on himself because all he wants to talk about is a Tour de France and that record pursuit. I'll hand the mic over to you, Kate Bates. <laughs> oh, man. There's a lot to unpack here. I don't – I reckon um, there's a little bit of, you know, don't look at me, don't look at me in those comments when it comes to no pressure, no expectation. Pfft. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Astana are not paying him um, to be pack fill and to just ride along. And (laughs) I think that that is probably not exactly the scenario. However, when you come off a team like Quick Step with Lefebvre, I guess anybody seems like a really nice guy, right? Um, And and Vinokurov, Vino, as they like to call him, um, which why not? It stands for wine. Who doesn't like that? Is you know, maybe he is a little bit more relaxed, but when push comes to shove, yep. they're having to put together a lead out for him. They're typically not a sprint team and a lead out team. They're having to put that together. They're putting a lot of investment in it. So I see there being um, a bit of pressure. And I reckon if he didn't perform very well at the beginning of the season, that no worries, just happy to have you might change pretty quickly into, okay, we said that because we figured you'd win. You're not winning. Chop, chop. Yeah. You know what's going on. But Most definitely. it's been the comments have been really interesting as well because he said, and this kind of kicked off a little bit of internet in that debate, and uh, was that, you know, I'm different to Merck's anyway. I have my own records. Like there is no competition. I stand alone from him. I don't need to be compared to him. Okay. Um, he's a very competitive sprinter. I yeah. call total BS on well, him so not who wanting are you trying to, to beat convince that. there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah, yeah. it's he's equaled the record. He hasn't beaten the record, and he's the type of rider who wants to be the best, beat things. So, yeah, I reckon he's putting it all out there, maybe just to stop people asking. But I think there's probably a lot of pressure. But we'll see how it goes. I'm chill. I'm relaxed. It's I'm all chill. cool. <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's hey, look. <laughs> Let's let's see how it unfolds. Now, I just want to mention quickly, I've actually contacted our legal team, Kate Bates. Now, our legal team is our producer, Merksy, who we've got studying a law degree by night uh, so that he can defend us <laughs> in the near future. Just as now, an insurance policy against me, Yeah, in my pretty opinions. much. But our, our first suit will actually be us uh, prosecuting Netflix because they've stolen our idea about making a Cav doco. Now, they're producing a doco mm. about Cav's career, whatever. Um I think it's going to be fascinating. Have you got a name? Can I put you on the spot? Have you got a name Oof. for the Cav Doco? Oh, look, I, I think if they don't call it the Manx Missile, they're missing a beat there because that's yeah. kind of an auto given, isn't it? Like, sure. Okay. I don't know, like Little Man Big Power. Oh. <laughs> it's probably okay. not as catchy, is it? I don't know. Hmm. All right, lot to cover in that Doco though. Um, <laughs> Of all the of all the riders you could dial in on for a doco, other than you know you look at your Armstrongs and stuff like that, obviously great doco fodder. Cav's up there. Cav is right up there oh. with his journey. Oh yeah, he's definitely up there. I mean, not only because he's won so many races, but he's also been ejected from races. He's thrown, yeah. you know, a good solid number of headbutts uh, along the way. He's it's everything. It's Hollywood, including, you know, the breaking into his house and the watch getting stolen and oh, all that jazz. It's there's a yeah. lot of layers to it. It's it's nuanced. There's many layers, a couple of tanties to throw in there. And of course that sparkling record um, that he doesn't care about, by the way. I'm not interested. It doesn't matter. No one cares. <laughs> Why are you talking well, about the record? And, I wasn't um, bringing it up. Speaking of uh, the break in two, they went to court this week. He was in the papers for that as well. And the people who broke into his house and um, at knife point, I might add, so not just snuck in when no one was there and stole his watches, they got 15 years in jail. I still don't know, though. Did he get his watch back? Do we know that? I'm, I'm, you'll have to ask Scott McGrory about that. He's all over the yeah. watches uh, side of things, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. But look, very traumatic experience. It was 2021, knife point in the Cavendish home. Uh, look, pff, not for me to talk about sentences and the length. 15 years is a, is a hefty time. <laughs> oh, come on knife, now. But... Come on now, Joel. Weigh in. 
I've already. I'll get Merckx to do it when he finishes uh, his first unit of his law degree, because I'm sure they're covering knife point <laughs> home invasions as one of their first units. But look, it, it's been a big, a huge couple of months for Cav. So let's let's put all of that aside. We're going to see him on the bike, Tour of Oman in new colours. Uh, that that's something the cycling world can cheer about. Another thing the cycling world can cheer about on the Wheelhouse Podcast is one of the world's oldest races, 1895. The, the Melbourne to Warrnambool, it's, it does, you don't need headlines. It, it speaks for itself. It's got beautiful tradition, all of that around it. However, this week, the headlines were stolen in emphatic fashion when a, a certain Chris Froome lit up the hype machine with his entrance, late entrance to the race, rocking up in a light aircraft. They've delayed the start of the race by a little bit of time, I think 10 minutes or something, because his plane was running late. But you do that kind of thing for Chris Froome. He he didn't win. He came 12th. He said it's a training run. That's fine. It's great. I want to just highlight one thing. Benny Hill. Aussie Benny Hill. Kate, what a moment this is. So he's like, I find myself on my own with Froomey, 60 Ks out from the finish, just the two of us. And he's like, you know what? This works. This is a really <laughs> cool moment for me. Let's stick together. What about the scenes here? F- F- Froomey's apologising to him 30 k's later, saying, sorry, bro, I'm pretty gassed here. You know, if you want to say, no, no, it's all good. Just, 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 you're right, Chris Froome, legend of the sport. You just, just stay on my wheel and you'll be fine, son. And they stay together. Ben Hill later is like, oh, look, I could have pushed, but I had a moment to ride with Chris Froome. And I did it. That's pretty cool. It's very cool. He wasn't riding for the win to to make that clear. So Ben Hill yeah. didn't choose to ride with Chris Froome or to ride for the win. Um, although he may have still made the same choice. Who knows? Uh, ben Hill has a huge long history at the Melbourne to Warrnambool. Uh, he's been on the podium there before. He's also been on the podium at Esports World. So he's a really good athlete himself. Uh, domestically, he's won a lot and even uh, – He's raced a fair bit around Asia and had some pretty good results. So domestically, he's a bit of a hero. Isn't it kind of cool that with everything he's achieved, he's still a little bit starstruck by Chris Froome, a bit like, oh, this is a story to tell, um, to be able to ride with him in a break for 60 kilometres, just uh, he and Froomey. you kind of got to be besties at the end of that. Um, like away, that's yeah. It's an experience. You go through that together. Um, but I just want to hark back a second, Joel. He arrived on a light plane, delayed the start of the race at Avalon uh, Airport, which is kind of between Melbourne and uh, and Geelong. Do we know why he arrived on a light plane and didn't, you know, drive like everybody else? Like where was he coming it. from? <laughs> It's I, I, like every story has glossed over that. It's this kind of rock star entrance on a light plane with yeah, his bike and his Bond. full kit. But yep. it's still not clear whether, you know, that was strictly necessary or, or what the go was. But either way, a little bit of uh, rock and roll for the race, I guess. And big kudos to the uh, race organisers as well, to Karen Jones and her team, because they offered him start money. He said no, they instead donated it all um, to yep. his charity of choice, which is a pretty cool thing to do uh, yep. for the organisers because they are a, a small event um, in terms of every dollar counts for them to make it happen um, year in and year out. So they could have just kept that money when he said he didn't need it. But to donate it to a charity, I think that that shows a whole lot of goodwill as well. Yeah, his charity out of uh, Kenya, I believe, which is a very, very meaningful uh, pursuit for him as well. So that's awesome. I love that he came before he said it's going to be an epic day out on the bike. This is before hitting the uh, 270 odd Ks. And after it, he's like, I finished cross eyed. But I tell you what, gee, it was worth it. I wanted more Ks in my legs before heading to Europe. But as I explained to Ben Hill, I was just gassed because I've done so many rides. He said I've done like 350Ks in the days leading up to the race, which is possibly why he had to get the plane because he's like, I literally can't walk from my hotel to the Uber because I'm, I'm just, can you just bring a plane literally to the, like, so I don't, just carry me to the plane. That'd be great. <laughs> it is, it's pretty cool to have that kind of star power there, isn't he? And uh, a lot of people will remember that for for eons to come the time Chris Froome uh, it'll become like folklore you know yeah. to the point where people were like it doesn't even matter whether Chris Froome did or didn't ride it's a great story 
It's the flying. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, and yeah. the women, um, the women didn't have uh, Annemiek van Vloten, that would be the equivalent in their field, but they had a cracking field too. And mm. Sophie Edwards pulled the win off there. Uh, cracking ride from her from ARA Skip Capital. But Chloe Hosking was on the podium. And Joel, that may well be the last we see of Chloe because. Yeah. I don't believe she has signed a team and she said if she hadn't by this point, um, she was hanging the bike up. So I guess yep. watch this space for an update. You teased this in the last episode that we might be seeing the last of, of Chloe. Good on her for getting up there. A lot of, lot of emotions swirling around there as well. Did you see anything on the podium that indicated finality? Mm, no, not really. But no. Chloe is... In many ways, a very open book. She talks straight from the heart, but um, she also doesn't speak unless it's needed. You know, she doesn't um, use her words unless they're important. And I I think that it would be quite an emotional time for her personally in reconciling what she should do um, moving forward. So, you know, I mean, if if you're asking were there any like tears or great announcements on the podium, that's a no. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but Hard she's no. racing well. She's clearly in form. It would be pretty tough to uh, step away when you're at that point. Yeah, she'd be wrestling with quite a quite a bit at the moment. Uh, yeah, as you say, shout out to uh, Sophie Edwards. Just a lazy four hours and thirty three minutes on the bike uh, to take that one out. And Tristan Saunders finishing ahead of Brendan Green and 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 nineteen year old Bailey McDonald in the men's, which. Uh, Yet another name, yet another name, Kate Bates, to uh, Oof, to, to ride two hundred and sixty-seven k at nineteen is yeah. not a small achievement. Just a lazy seven? Is it seven hours roughly in the? Yeah, give or it's, take. It's a, a, many hours, anyway. <laughs> More hours than I'll ever do. Now, almost out of time on the Wheelhouse Podcast. There's something that's got me. I don't know. It's it's kind of surreal, and uh, you know, I'm a cricket fan, and it's taken a couple of years getting used to the cricket, uh, the summer of cricket playing out on Channel 7 instead of Channel 9. This weirdness in sport broadcasting rights changing hands and going behind paywalls, all of that sort of thing, continues because no less than the Olympics is shifting to Channel 9. It is. They're moving homes. Yeah, they announced it and uh, everybody seems very excited. It's not just the next Olympics for Paris. It's also LA and then Brisbane um, 2032. So pretty big news on a domestic front in terms of broadcasting. I mean, if you look at a lot of the um, other countries, because in Australia we do change Olympic networks, but most of the other countries it would be so odd and bizarre to have the yeah. Olympics change networks. So it's a little bit of a quirk of uh, the Australian media um, format, but uh, there you go. So Channel 9, they also had the World Championships um, in Wollongong. So maybe, Joel, they were like mm, just dipping their toe in the water. Perhaps. Yeah. Okay. I, it's. I. It feels like it's been seven for as long as I can remember. Going back to I'm, I'm ninety two Barcelona at least. I might be wrong, but anyway, it's been it's been a long mm. time. Uh, institution. Wonder hang your hat on, and uh, that's going to change. And the goose, the golden goose, there is obviously Brisbane twenty thirty two. Like that coverage, domestically, it's it's a massive massive get for. Uh, do we know? Do we know figures? Do we know any idea? Yeah, what's, three hundred and five uh, million it costs for five Olympics. Uh, that's really cheap. So three sorry, summer but... and two winter. So okay, that's like a third of the AFL broadcasting, right? Under a third, less than that. Okay, sure. Yeah, that, I, I, I'm honestly, I mean, I think we could have almost launched a vid for I was it, Joel. Say. Yeah, I was, didn't realize it was that cheap. Jeez, I would have yeah, forgotten my morning coffee and put it towards <laughs> that instead. Uh, just quickly, the Australian Mountain Bike and Cyclocross Championships coming up. Let's book in. We were talking about cyclocross at the start and my great desire for it to be embraced more in Australia. I guess this mm. is another step in that direction. We're heading to Threadbow. Who are we looking out for, Kate? Threadbow. Uh, well, there's a whole host of events, which is important um, to point out because we've got cross country short track, we've got cross country, we've got trials, we've got pump track. Uh, any kid with a BMX knows what that is. Um, mm. And it sounds also like got a segment downhill. from video hits. Pump track. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Uh, yeah. So there's a lot on, and and in the women, um, Beck Henderson is going for her 10th in a row national title in the cross country, which is pretty cool. If she can pull it off, I reckon she probably will. 
Over in the men, though, it's a bit more open. Last year it was won by a fellow by the name of Matt Dinham, who's an incredible t- talent. He's mm. not back to defend his title, Joel, because he's heading to Europe uh, with Team Des- DSM to um, partake in his professional road career in the world tour. Uh, so our best talent is being poached by the road, our best mountain bike talent. But, no, we do have a lot of uh, depth coming through, especially in the mountain bike um, downhill which, you know what downhill is, Joel? Like strap your helmet on, strap all your gear on and just go. Yeah, 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 of course. Like, you know don't I'm a touch bike your brakes. Enthusiast. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I've never bra- tried wait, it. mountain bikes have brakes? <laughs> Kidding. I, so, yeah, I need them. have never tried downhill. I reckon it would be terrifying. But they make it look so easy and they have so many skills. And Australia internationally has a, a really good record uh, in the downhill. So if anybody, you know, feels like taking a road trip to Threadbow, uh, get on it. It'll be yeah. it'll be exciting. Uh, but also it's the same weekend as eSport Worlds. So uh, fair to say that it's going to be a pretty massive couple of weeks coming up. Um, you know, Podge is racing again. Cavendish is back in action. Yeah. Uh, we've got all this stuff on. So, you know, no reason for people to be channel surfing. You can find all the mountain biking on um, SBS. So just tune in there and find yourself a new discipline to get behind. Yeah, love that. The world through two wheels, a, a two wheeled lens. There you go. Um, Indeed. <laughs> great coverage. Well done, Matty Dinham, by the way. We were talking about him a bit last year as, as one to just like, whew, look out. Yet another name. Yet another name for the wheelhouse list of ones to watch. Uh, Kate Bates, it's been a pleasure. Always, Joel. Always. I'll be back in the bunker next week. But uh, for now, I've got my wheelhouse hoodie on. I'm in a little bit of colder territory. And uh, yeah, just bunking down weird. and watching the racing. <laughs> okay. Well, you you enjoy. Uh, thank you very much for your company. Don't forget to like, follow, share, subscribe. Tell everyone you know. It's a lot of fun on the Wheelhouse podcast while we're still going. L- lawsuits against Netflix pending. My name's Joel Spreadborough. Uh, really appreciate your company. See you next time. The Wheelhouse Podcast is produced at River City Studios for Listener. Big shout out to our sponsors at Champion System, Piss A and Grow Getters Group Australia. It's produced by the mysterious Merxy and presented by Catherine Bates and me, Joel Spreadburn.